Welcome to My Hometown, the program that explores clubs, organizations, businesses, and issues across Nassau and Suffolk counties and sheds light on the different towns that are making a difference. Hello and welcome to My Hometown. I'm Bill Horan, along with my co-host, Nassau Community College student, Matt Leonard, coming to you live via Zoom and being socially distant as recommended. Bill, today we're going to learn about a nonprofit organization called the Family and Children's Association, or FCA, which is dedicated to providing help and hope to Long Island's most vulnerable children, families, seniors, and communities. This sounds like a great organization with an important mission. So let's find out more from our guest, Dr. Jeffrey L. Reynolds, the president and CEO of Family and Children's Association. Dr. Reynolds, welcome to my hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be on with you. First of all, let's start on a personal matter. How have you been doing through these COVID times and down on your organization? Uh, any live cases that we have to worry about or that uh, have interrupted your operations? Well, you know, it's been uh, it's been a journey, just like it has for everybody else. But we're beginning to turn a corner. Um, I myself have been double vaccinated. A lot of our staff have actually been double vaccinated, particularly those who are client facing. And so that gives some level of security. Um, but it's certainly been a journey. I don't think any of us planned that things were going to necessarily play out in this way. In fact, I think back to a year ago, and I was at a gathering of not-for-profit executives with our COO, and people were talking about making plans and gearing up and that kind of thing. And we left, and as we were walking out to the to our cars, I said, I think we need to be doing more. I don't think we're we're ready. This is going to be a bigger thing. Um, And so we made some plans and nobody thought that we were going to wind up in this place a year later. So we had kind of thought about this as a as a short term problem rather than a big time problem. And we have at FCA 340 staff, about 250 volunteers, and we serve about 30,000 Long Islanders per year. And so the the crisis has had a huge impact on our staff, both both personally and professionally on our volunteers and certainly on the people we serve. Those are some huge numbers. So our audience knows you're doing a lot of work and have a lot of good people doing that work. So that's great to hear. Matt? Can you tell us more about what FCA is all about and better explain the mission statement we talked about at the top of the show? For us at FCA, we've been around for 136 years. And so this is not our first pandemic. Um, our, our founders battled the uh, Spanish flu epidemic crisis in Um, 1918 and 1919. And since then, the organization has survived and helped people through a couple of world wars, the Great Depression, Sandy, 9-11, and whatever has come our way. And I'm really proud of the fact that through all of this, we never closed our doors. We never wavered. We persisted on and made sure that we were lifting people up during their time of crisis. And so when we talk about lifting Long Islanders up, we serve folks who are uh, infants right through to seniors. And so we run 30 different programs, everything from a pre-K in the village of Hempstead to two chemical dependency treatment centers that are located in Hicksville and Hempstead. We run two recovery centers for young people who have found a path to recovery. We've got a mental health program for young people that have mental illness. We run four residential programs including Nassau County's only shelter for runaway homeless and trafficked kids. Um, That's been a a hot um, issue for us over the course of COVID. And then, you know, one of the services that we run that doesn't get a lot of discussion is our senior programs. And one of the things we know about Nassau County is the fastest growing population in Nassau County are folks who are over the age of 80. And as we make our way through the rest of this COVID experience, we know that seniors and especially people who were in skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes um, suffered from COVID in a disproportionate kind of way. And so everything we do is focused on helping people through whatever challenges they're encountering. And these days it happens to be COVID, but COVID is really intertwined with things like poverty and homelessness. And these days with substance use and with, with mental health disorders. And so even the most well-adjusted person, whatever that looks like, um, has suffered anxiety and depression and uncertainty in the midst of COVID. Um, We know that alcohol sales here in New York State are up 35%. We know that overdose fatalities are up year over year by 41% here in Nassau County. Um, And we've now begun to see the emergence of methamphetamine. 
Um, you look at the food lines in Nassau County and they run a couple miles long. And so COVID has brought out, I think, the best in Long Islanders who have rallied to help their neighbors, but it's also been a double whammy for folks that were dealing with a whole bunch of pre-existing conditions before COVID ever arrived. Well, I think you guys have been doing a lot of really great work there based on what you said. And let me make sure I got this right. You said 136 years you've been around? We have. We have. Of course, I look much younger and haven't been doing that entire time. <laughs> you do. You look great. Because <laughs> I, I was thinking, you've been around longer than Bill then, the, whole, the organization. Like, oh, that's a shot. That's a shot. I'll get you back for that one. <laughs> Dr. Reynolds, I was thinking, this, when you said that, that was what resonated with me, too. 136 years. I mean, we, we do a lot of shows. We have profits, not for profits. I don't think anybody's close to that. If, if somebody started by the year 2000 or, or and many, many go back to the 1990s or 1980s, you go back 100 years before that even. Yeah. So, so the 1880s, and I will tell you just for me as someone that's been given the, the chance to run this organization for a period of time, it does create an immense sense of responsibility. And so you got 136 years of history. Um, you know, I'll tell you, when, when the board hired me, you know, seven years ago, my first thought was, don't mess it up, <laughs> because there's, there's a huge responsibility here. And FCA has been known to, to care for our neighbors. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that we went through this, this period of time and that we didn't skip a beat. And, you know, I guess I have something to do with that, but not that much. It's really our staff that came to work every day, that continued to put their own needs aside, you know, I had parents who were doing management meetings with us, bouncing children on their on their knees as as they tried to to actually hold the conversation via via Zoom. And you know, our staff came through this in a remarkable kind of way. So I'm the guy that gets to talk to you guys uh, on a day like today, and I get to pick up plaques and accolades and that kind of thing. But it's actually our staff that are working 24 seven to do the work. Well, that's the mark of a true leader who talks about their staff and doesn't just take the credit. So we appreciate that. And obviously, both you, your staff, from the highest to the lowest to the volunteers are doing an awesome job because uh, we hear the expression, be an agent of change every day. You're helping or changing someone's life, mostly, I'm sure, for the better. As much as you try to do your best, there's probably some who fall off the cliff but I'm sure you're doing a fantastic job. Can you tell our audience, I think you have about five different divisions that you work with there. Um, kind of give us a little overview of each division. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll go back to the, the substance use piece because I mentioned that. Um, and as you know, Long Island over the course, and in fact, the nation has battled an opioid crisis for the past you know, 10 or 12 years in some ways related to um, overprescribing of, of opioids, uh, but due to some other things as well. And Long Island's been hit particularly hard and, and at our height, which was probably 2016, um, we were seeing about 400 overdoses per year, which amounts to more than one per day, fatal overdoses. And fatal overdoses are just kind of one mark of the problem. And we had begun to make some really amazing gains in that area through prevention and access to treatment and support for people in recovery and some pretty cool partnerships with law enforcement in which we changed the way we dealt with folks that had um, substance use disorders. And then COVID hit and the disruption to the drug supply was very, very significant. Um, and so the ports were closed, international air travel stopped. So it meant the flow of heroin into our community was limited. Um, also, folks who might have been using heavily no longer had access to um, cash necessary to buy drugs. You had young people who were addicted to opioids and now were detoxing upstairs in their parents' homes. And mom and dad believed that they just had a serious flu or a cold. And so we saw that all on full display. And at the same time, the only one of the only essential services here in New York State was alcohol. And before you couldn't leave a restaurant with an open container, all of a sudden you could back up your car and have a 55-gallon drum worth of margaritas put in your trunk with home delivery and everything else. And so when you combine that availability and the destruction of the drug supply with unprecedented anxiety and depression and uncertainty and folks not having to go to work and you know, doing Zoom calls in their pajamas and those kinds of things and their, their daily lives disrupted, we've just seen a significant increase in substance use disorders. And for some folks who had found a path to recovery, we've seen a fair amount of relapse. 
And if you think about it, we talked about quarantinis. There were all the mommy wine memes all over Facebook. There were discussions of day drinking. And for the average person, we kind of look at that and chuckle. And it's, you know, it's funny. Um, but for someone who's struggled with alcoholism in the past, um, really, really triggering. And so we've seen a big uptick in, um, in the requests for those services. And I would say, you know, whereas it used to be all opioids all the time, those fatalities are up. But the most startling thing is the upswing in the use of alcohol. And there's a whole bunch of people now who are being called back to come into the office, you know, nationwide. And they're like, but I drink at two o'clock. How am I going to go back to the office? Um, and I'm so anxious and depressed and now do this so regularly, I need some help in order to stop. So that's been a very busy um, service for us. We also have an emergency room program that we have skilled and trained and peers and volunteers, folks that have some lived experience with overdose who actually respond to hospitals and work with overdose survivors to try to get them into treatment. And so our addiction treatment and recovery space has been very, very busy. And Related to that, I mentioned we have a children's mental health division. The two things are pretty closely aligned. Um, And I would say a lot of our services move to telehealth, which had some real pluses to it. Um, The fact that um, you can jump on to a Zoom or FaceTime with a counselor, um, especially if you're coming for care for the first time, is, is a huge win. It means that you don't have to go through all of the angst of setting up an appointment and finding someone to drive you and walking through the door the first time and doing an intake form sitting in the lobby. And, you know, all of that was removed from the equation. And then if you called us and said, I need to talk to a counselor, you know, our response would be, how about an hour? We'll log on to Zoom and we'll have a conversation. There is a lot to be gained in that kind of interaction and that kind of immediate on-demand care. But one of the things we found is that, um, especially for kids, um, the higher your level of impairment, the less that actually worked out for you. And we found that kids who tended to be a little bit sicker in terms of their mental health status or who had chaotic family lives going on behind them, it was really hard to engage and to have some of those conversations. And if you think about the last conversation you had with an eight-year-old in which you got one-word responses. Now imagine you don't have a relationship with that eight-year-old. Imagine that eight-year-old has a significant psychiatric diagnosis. Um, It becomes harder to provide care in that way. And so we moved to telehealth and we pivoted very quickly with some mixed results. So if you were basically okay, but you needed some support and guidance through this, telehealth was a huge breakthrough and it's something that should continue. Um, If you were someone who was a little bit sicker, it was not as successful for you. And for those folks, we've now transitioned to a hybrid model of FaceTime, Zoom, you know, some level of technology with some face-to-face appointments taking into account social distancing. And so those are two key areas where um, we've seen incredible growth. I'm really proud of what we did. Um, Telehealth has been something that's been bubbling in the background for a long time, I'm happy to see that we're finally using technology and things like FaceTime for good rather than making people feel lousy about their lives compared to others. And so I do think there's a a plus in this. And I think it's the way younger people tend to interact. The downside is we've come to understand that you still need the hugs and the handshakes and the things that make people feel accepted, make people feel wanted um, and make people feel cared for. Now, let me ask you, before we go uh, back to Matt, if someone is hearing this and saying, gee, that's wonderful, how do they go about, do they need a referral? Uh, Do they have to come in with their priest or their doctor or a nurse or or, um, another not-for-profit? Can they just come to you? Is there a fee? Can you kind of give us the um, way in the door? Yeah, so so you don't need to come in with anybody. You simply need to pick up the phone and call us, um, 516-746-0350. Uh, 7460350. We have a website, as everybody does. It's fcali.org. Um, we're all over social media. If you can't find us, just Google FCA or Family and Children's Association and, and we'll come up. You know, one of the things we say is that there's no wrong door when you come here. It doesn't matter how you get here. And it actually doesn't really matter what your problem is. And if it's not a service we provide, Uh, we'll get you to somebody who can help you. And we're not going to leave your side until we get you there. 
Um, there's no charge for any of our services. If you have insurance, we will tap into your insurance. If you have Medicaid, we will use that. But if you say, I don't have insurance, I don't have Medicaid, I don't have this, I don't have that, no strings attached, that's fine. We care so, for everybody. Because that's so inviting, I, I want our audience to know that FCA stands for Family and Children's Association. Now it's probably ringing in their ears saying, wait a minute, I want to know who is this guy we're talking to. Our guest today is Dr. Jeffrey Reynolds. He's the president and CEO of Family and Children's Association. And you said to me there's several outlets around Long Island so that if someone wants to come, they can find you pretty easily. Absolutely. And we know the nature of Long Island and the transportation barrier. So a lot of our services are field based as well. Best news we could get. So all, all uh, check all winning boxes. I've been monopolizing your time, so I'm going to go back to Matt. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I mean, I guess I deserve that for what I said earlier, but fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> you are listening to My Hometown on The Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Matt Leonard, and I'm along with Bill Haran, and today we are talking about a nonprofit organization called the Family and Children's Association, or FCA, which is dedicated to providing help and hope to Long Island's most vulnerable children, families, seniors, and communities with our guest, Dr. Jeffrey L. Reynolds, the president and CEO of FCA. Jeffrey, you mentioned earlier COVID and telehealth was a big challenge for you guys in the beginning of that before you moved to these hybrid models. What were some other big challenges you all faced as an organization? Thanks, Matt. I think one of the key things was um, the healthcare disparities. And so we have a preventative division that works heavily in the village of Hempstead, and we've worked in Hempstead since our founding. And one of the things we know is that COVID infections and COVID fatalities in communities like Hempstead, Freeport, Uniondale, Roosevelt, um, impoverished communities and largely minority communities, rates of infection, rates of fatalities were several times what they were in neighboring white communities. If you think about a place like Garden City, um, very few COVID fatalities. But when you look at Hempstead, just a huge amount and kind of the largest number in Nassau County. Some of that relates to the pre-existing conditions that were out there. And so that folks who are living in poverty tend to live in multi-generational households, tend to live in cramped living conditions. They tend to be doing all the essential jobs. Um, while we were all able to work remotely via Zoom, they were out picking up gloves and masks out of you know Walmart parking lots and those kinds of things. They were working in grocery stores. They were providing skilled nursing services. And so those disparities were on full display. We, you know, immediately partnered with uh, Island Harvest and Long Island Cares and some of the food banks in terms of making sure that people had access to food. Um, we did wellness checks in the community. Right now, our focus, as you could probably imagine, and it will be for the foreseeable future, has been educating communities that might be a little bit distrustful around vaccine safety and encouraging vaccinations. One of the things we know is that um, there are many communities on Long Island, disproportionately minority communities, that have a huge amount of distrust uh, around medical technology, around government, um, and with good reason, quite frankly. And everybody points to the Tuskegee syphilis experiments as the reason why the reality is the healthcare disparities exist even today. And so um, we do that among our staff. And so here at FCA, um, 69% of our staff are people of color. Um, and so for us, that starts internally. Uh, 79% of our staff are female, many of them single moms with kids. And so in a lot of regards, the lives of our staff mirror the lives of the people we serve, um, which is actually good because I believe and FCA believes that sometimes the people who are closest to the problems are also closest to the solutions. And so we believe in that not only should we be serving people, we should be employing people and giving them meaningful work and meaningful jobs. So the preventative division was very busy. One of the other programs that I'll mention just real quick is we have a credible messenger program in the village of Hempstead in which we actively employ folks that um, have former gang affiliations and have been involved in, in violent crime in the past. And they actually do some of our street outreach around violence. And we know that one of the things that happened during COVID um, is that we've seen an uptick in community-based violence. And so that team is, is really vital there. One of the things that didn't change, Matt, is we have, I mentioned, four residential programs, and there everything continued to operate almost as if it was, and we kind of held on for dear life, just hoping that we wouldn't have positive clients in those programs, and then we'd have to quarantine staff in the house and, and that kind of thing. The program that was actually the busiest was our shelter for runaway homeless and trafficked kids, 
And the reason it was so busy is here on Long Island, and it, it extends to college students, we know that there are a lot of young people who are actually couch surfing because they don't have somewhere regularly to stay. And if you said to them, are you homeless? They'd say, no, well, I sleep on this friend's couch this week. And then the next week I go sleep at another friend's house. Well, all the couch surfing stopped during COVID. These families said, no, we don't want anybody else in our house. We're quarantined. And so you had a whole bunch of young people who suddenly had nowhere to go in the middle of a pandemic when everything was closed. And so um, that house for us, and it's at a confidential location in Wanto, was um, was very, very busy during during COVID. And we managed to keep everybody pretty safe. Dr. Reynolds, uh, what you're saying is so impressive to me. I, I want to interrupt our usual flow of questions and ask you, if someone is out there listening, whether it's a college student, a retired lawyer, teacher, sociologist, psychologist, um, can they be of use to you? Is there an opportunity to volunteer where they could do meaningful work with your organization? Uh, is there a message you want to tell them? Because this is a good chance to get it out and uh, let our audience know about this. Yeah, Bill, thanks for asking that, for kind of teeing it up for me. You know, I, I would say, you know, we have 250 volunteers, and I would say most of what we do wouldn't be possible without some of those volunteers. And FCA has always been about, um, you know, neighbors helping neighbors, whether you're on our staff um, or you're a volunteer. And I think similar to what happened during 9-11, I think, pandemics, big, big things that happen in our community often give us a new sense of gratitude and a new sense of purpose and meaning and get people to, to hone in on what's really important. And we know now, I think one of the great lessons out of COVID is the health of my neighbors potentially impacts my health. And that was always true pre-COVID, right? And that if people- really are, true now. <laughs> yeah. And, and now it's become very, very clear. And so I always believe that we were connected. And if, if, you know, you're not doing as well as I am. That impacts me economically, socially, and certainly from a health standpoint. But now when it comes to COVID, having entire communities that are not well, that don't understand vaccines, um, is something that puts us all at risk. And we know long after everybody is vaccinated, the mental health implications and consequences of COVID are going to last for probably an entire generation. When I think about the learning loss suffered by young people, and look, I have two young kids. The time we spent together was an absolute gift, um, never to be replicated, I'm sure. It was a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing. Um, but I also know that many kids, including my own, suffered some learning loss. And I look at that and say, time with dad, algebra, which is more important? You have a phone to be able to do math on. You know, Families are replaceable. They can learn algebra when I'm long gone. Um, you can't replace that time. But I do think that we have a job in front of us. And the big thing I worry about is, you know, the rest of the world declaring this over before it's over for everyone. And that's where communities come in. We always rely on government. I'm the first one to point at government and say, you ought to give us money to do this. You ought to do that. But this is really going to be about communities coming together for the long term. And so coming and helping out, whether it's delivering meals, whether it's checking on seniors, whether it's you have a degree and you can help with counseling some folks maybe being a mentor to a young person who's struggling right now to catch up with their schooling. We have a million and one opportunities for people to make a difference. Call us. I'll give the number again, 516-746-0350. Hit us up online, um, fcali.org, or check us out on social media. Um, regardless of what your sweet spot might be or what your life experience might be, we have something for you. If you tell me I really care about seniors, I have more than 500 seniors that require daily checks at this point in time. Come, I'm happy to give you three of them. You could go knock on a door and just say hello and check in on them. If kids are your thing, there's a million and one kids who could use a friendly voice and a helping hand right about now. And as you said, it, one, it's a great way for us to help our neighbor. Many of us, uh, we may not be on the food line, but there's not a lot of extra cash around, but we certainly have the time to do good things. Perhaps even some of this can be done from home or in our own neighborhood. Yeah. And on the other uh, venue, a lot of college students are, aren't on the bus every day or high school going back and forth to schools, et cetera. They have more time. What a great way to learn about the world and get out there and see different professions, what they're doing to help the world, and, and maybe form their direction that they'll take as, as they move into adulthood. So you're giving us a lot of opportunities. Well, and you know, almost everybody who volunteers says, I get more than I give. 
and they talk about the people they meet and the life experiences and the gratitude they feel. Um, it's also a great opportunity to meet other people. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people complain during COVID. I don't get to socialize. I don't get to meet anybody. If, if you're out on the dating scene, not saying FCA is the place to come and find a date, but meeting people who are like-minded and want to help their community in a time when you can't go stand in a bar for hours on end. It's a great way to connect with other people, whether simply as your neighbors or if you're looking for a, a partner in crime. And a lot safer way today than standing in a bar for hours on end. hundred <laughs> percent. Matt? <laughs> Well, you guys have done a lot of great work for the past 136 years, but what do you have planned for the years to come? Any new programs or anything new coming up? Yeah, we're really gearing up. And, you know, like I said, I don't think this is going to be over anytime soon. And I think the pandemic will have changed the landscape in a pretty significant way. And I think similar to what this region learned from Sandy in terms of how ill-prepared we were, Um, I think we're learning that about the pandemic now to say, all right, so we weren't really well prepared. What is it we need to do to be stronger the next time around for the next thing that arrives? And whether that's two years from now or 135 years from now, um, we want to make sure that we're ready. I want to build on what we've learned about technology and telehealth and make sure that we're incorporating the best of that while at the same time finding some ways around the worst of it. I do think um, the learning loss is going to be a pretty significant issue. Uh, We recently um, got some additional funds and, you know, I'll tell you that we were really worried about the economy and and last year was a rough year for FCA. We did get a PPP loan that I'm hoping will be forgiven that carried us through, but government funding pulled back and here in New York state, they started withholding 20% of our funds precisely at a time when we needed them the most. They've reversed all that. And there's now some some word coming out of Washington and out of Albany and and out of Mineola because it runs from the feds to the state to the county that there will be some additional resources available for -for not-for-profits like ours that are dealing with those mental health consequences, that are helping young people address the learning loss, that are helping folks who are chronically employed or hungry or homeless. And so I'm really optimistic about the potential flow of dollars into the communities and and finding a way to take everything we know about how best to provide services and bringing that to bear. And so it feels like a pretty exciting time to reinvent some of what we're doing. It's also a great time for the health and human services sector to figure out, so, you know, what have we got here and what do we need in order to meet, you know, the next wave of of challenges that come our way. So I'm really excited about telehealth. I'm really Our our senior programs, like I said, they don't always kind of capture the spotlight, but seeing what happened to seniors through all of this was a pretty significant thing. So I'm excited about that. Dr. Reynolds, one more time before we wrap up that phone number. Sure. 516-746-0350. Very good. Thank you so much. And we want to thank our guest today, Dr. Jeffrey Reynolds. He's the president and CEO of Family and Children's Association. Dr. Reynolds, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Matt. See you soon. I'm Bill Horan. I'm here with Matt Leonard. We thank you for listening to this week's special edition of My Hometown. We like to get your feedback on My Hometown. Send your comments to whpc at ncc.edu. Nassau Community College, where success starts and continues. Till next time, this is Bill St. James. And remember, there's no town like your hometown. Hometown.